O.J. Madigan and his wife are waiting for us. And then we'll move on to Boston and the home of former mayor James Michael Curley and his family. We'll be ready to go in exactly 30 seconds. Hi, I'm Bob Dixon. Our sponsor is Amoco Gas. This is the Florida International Grand Prix, a punishing test of men, machines, and motor fuels. And it's interesting to note that of all motor fuels, the one chosen above all others by these true pros of the road is unleaded Amoco Gas. For only Amoco Gas guarantees 100% power with no lead fouling guaranteed. This weekend, fill up at the Amoco sign of greater values. Treat your car to the best, unleaded Amoco gas. And now here's Ed Murrow. It takes a strong man to run the nation's toughest penitentiary. And Warden Paul J. Madigan of Alcatraz is a veteran of almost 25 years in the federal prison service. He's had experience at five other federal institutions. And this is his third hitch at Alcatraz, where Warden and Mrs. Madigan, both natives of Minnesota, have now spent a total of some 13 years. When they first came to the island, their two daughters were very young. Now both have left to be married and make the Madigans grandparents of seven youngsters. That's what the girls left, Alcatraz. 12 acres of solid rock, the nation's toughest federal penitentiary. It's been described in four words, maximum security, minimum privileges. It's a mile and a half off San Francisco just 13 minutes by boat. The island houses some 300 federal prisoners, described as the worst type. For the first time, television cameras have been permitted inside Alcatraz. You are now in the big cell block, double bolted, time locked bars, and pink walls. Alcatraz has one guard for every three inmates. The prisoners spend some 14 hours a day in cells five feet wide, nine feet deep. More than a dozen men have tried to escape from the rock. None have made it. Good evening, Warden Madigan. Oh. Good evening, sir. Is everything under control in there tonight? Well, I hope so, Mr. Murrow. It looks very quiet and serene. You never know in this institution. It's a tough job. You never can release or relax on the pressure. And yet, you can't uh, worry. How would you describe the prisoners as a group? Oh, we have many types, Mr. Morrow. We have uh, many hardened men. We have cunning, shrewd individuals. We have some very uh, well-educated men. Of course, some without the intellectual advantages either. On the whole, they are quite well behaved, however. Well, sir, how many men do you normally have in solitary? I believe at Alcatraz it's called uh, segregation, isn't it? Well, there's a difference between solitary and segregation, uh, Mr. Morrow. In segregation, uh, we use that term to place uh, men in a block or a section to segregate them or separate them from the main cell block or inmate body. Solitary is a cell or a term used to designate a cell that we use for punishment. Well, just how do you punish them? Oh, there's several ways, uh, forfeiture of privileges, uh, confinement in a segregation block, or perhaps in a solitary cell. Warden Madigan, uh, just where are your quarters? Our quarters are outside, just about 100 feet from the uh, front entrance, Mr. Morrow. Will you let us out, please, uh, George? Warden Madigan, what's the average sentence of the men back there in the cell block? Uh, 21 years, Ed. And what's their average age? About uh, 34 years. How old is your youngest prisoner and your oldest? Well, our youngest man is 21 years of age, and the oldest inmate is 60. Well, Warden, uh, are you free to proceed, or has the system got you between two gates there? Well, uh, I think we're free to proceed. We still have another gate before us, Mr. Morrow, but I think we can get out all right. How do we get that one open? Pardon, Mr. Morrow? How do we get that one open? We've, we made it. <laughs> uh, Warden Madigan, 
Now I have a better idea of what maximum security means. But what does minimum privileges mean? Well, it means uh, a withholding of some of the privileges that the men had at the referring institution, which we do at this type of institution. What sort of thing is withheld? We don't, uh, we don't have newspapers at this institution, Ed. Uh, we do have a two-channel radio system. We don't have a commissary where they can supplement their uh, diet in the dining room. Uh, we have two movies a month. We have religious services for all three faiths each Sunday. We have a good recreational program, a good complete work program. Well, I imagine Mrs. Madigan uh, allows you considerably more privileges, doesn't she? Yes, she allows me more privileges than the boys have inside, Mr. Morrow. Where are we now, Warden? We're at the front entrance, Mr. Morrow, and we're looking toward our quarters as I walk. Warden, uh, what's the biggest trouble you've had since you became Warden? Well, the only trouble we've had of any consequence was one man hiding out last summer. Didn't amount to anything. Uh, Warden, would you concede that Alcatraz is probably the most unpleasant prison in the land? No, I don't believe so. There are many nice things about this institution, uh, Ed. It's clean, well-organized, single cells, and many things that uh, men who have served a lot of time appreciate. Uh, you spoke, I think, of prison industries. Exactly what did you mean, Warden? Well, I mean the shops that we have, Ed, that are under our federal prison system, federal prison industry system. We have a, uh, a large laundry, a glove shop, a tailor shop, furniture refinishing, and a uh, brush shop. Ed, I'd like to have you meet Mrs. Madigan now. Good evening, Mrs. Madigan. Good evening, Mr. Morrow. How do you like living on Alcatraz? Well, believe it or not, Mr. Morrow, Alcatraz is home. And we lead as, almost as normal a life here as anybody in Main Street, United States. Well, we have uh, various activities. We have uh, those people who wish to play cards. We have canasta, bridge, and pinnacle clubs. Those people who wish to bowl or fish, there's a, a lovely bowling alley, and they can fish right off the island. And those who wish to dance, we have square dancing and lessons in ballroom dancing. We even have a, uh, corner, drug, a corner grocery store and a post office here. Well, it sounds very comfortable, but living as close as you do to some of the nation's toughest criminals, do you worry a great deal? No, Mr. Murrow. Back in 1934, when I came here, I made up my mind that if I were going to live here, I couldn't worry. One can't live with fear. How about you, Warden Madigan? Uh, do you worry about your work? No, not too much, Mr. Morrow. I certainly uh, get a little tense once in a while, uh, realizing the potential that we have inside the institution. But I don't worry too much. Do you sleep well? I sleep very well and uh, have never had to take a pill. And I don't believe many people in San Francisco could say the same thing. <laughs> I'm sure you're right. How is the cooperation from Washington? Oh, it's very good, Mr. Murrow. Uh, these gentlemen here at my left are the men that make the Bureau of Prisons tick. This first gentleman, of course, is our Attorney General, Mr. Brownell, who heads the Department of Justice and is closely associated with the Bureau of Prisons. The other gentleman is my boss, Mr. James V. Bennett, who's been director of the Bureau of Prisons for more than 20 years, as well as commissioner of federal prison industries. He's given us a tremendous amount of help out here at this institution. And in my humble opinion, I feel that Mr. Bennett is the number one penologist in the country today. Well, you should certainly know. Uh, Mrs. Madigan, you must have a lovely view from your windows there on Alcatraz, haven't you? Yes, we do. Paul, why don't you show Mr. Morrow the view? Yes. I'll join you later. You'll come with me, Ed. Fine. I'll show you this view out of our living room window. We have a beautiful view here. That looks like the Bay Bridge. Oh, yes. And incidentally, it's a beautiful evening. No fog. 
There's Telegraph Hill and Coit Tower. The skyscrapers of the city of San Francisco. Makes me homesick for it. Yes, I imagine you'd like to see that again, Mr. Burrow. I Burrell. certainly would. We're working on around now to the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, yes, there it is. There it is. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful sight when the sun goes down. Beautiful sight at any time, isn't it? At any time, that's right. Those are the Marin Hills on the north side of the bay. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for letting us look at your view. We don't get tired of watching that. I can well imagine. Beautiful sight at any time. Uh, Mrs. Madigan, did, yes. uh, did you ever have a really bad experience on Alcatraz? Yes, I did, once, in May of 1941. My, two, my daughters, Mary and Florence, came home on the school boat and came rushing in the house, very upset and agitated. They had heard that their daddy had been taken hostage in the mat shop and had been hit on the head with a hammer. Father Clark, our prison chaplain, came in at that same time, so he told me he would run over to the prison and see, find out what was the matter. It was a, we were very relieved when he called and said that everything was under control. Warden, how did you get out of that when they were holding a hammer over your head? Oh, I don't know how that worked yet. It didn't amount to too much. Uh, our warden at that time, Warden Johnston, told the press that he believed that I had talked my way out of it, and I suppose I'd probably talk pretty fast in a situation like that. That must have been the toughest experience of your life, wasn't it? Well... Actually, it wasn't, Ed. I had an experience after World War I when I went home from the Navy of teaching school in a country school. I taught all eight grades from one to eight, and I'm sure that was the most difficult job I ever had in my life. <laughs> Mrs. Madigan, uh, with your daughters and their youngsters away from home, did you ever get lonely on Alcatraz? Only on holidays, and especially at Christmas. At Christmas? Yes. Uh, Warden, uh, is that a particularly trying period inside the penitentiary? Well, I think that is the most difficult day of the year, Ed. Christmas Eve is a lonesome day for anyone that's away from home. And I've seen men in cells weeping and sobbing, uh, just thinking about being away from their family. Warden, after a quarter of a century in the federal prison system, can you tell me what sort of mental process these long-time men use in order to survive, to keep their sanity? Well, in order to do a lot of time, Ed, and keep your stability, I'm sure you must uh, project your thoughts into a world of fantasy. You can't face reality each day without uh, doing some daydreaming and uh, projecting yourself into a different situation. What do they dream about, these daydreams? Oh, perhaps being home or some other place or doing some particular type of work or taking part in some pleasure that they wish. Uh, certainly you have to, have to do some dreaming. What satisfaction does your job offer you, Warden? Uh, pardon me, Ed. What kind of satisfaction do you get out of your job? Well, I think the greatest satisfaction I get is to see men change from bad behavior to good behavior. And uh, it certainly is a lot of satisfaction to see anyone released who has saved his money and had the opportunity to work in our federal prison industries and go out and be able to hold down a good job. I have uh, know a good many men that have served time here who are doing a very good job at this time. Thank you very much indeed, Warden Madigan, for letting us come and visit you on Alcatraz tonight. And thank you, Mrs. Madigan, very much. It's been a pleasure to have you, Mr. Morrow. Thank you. I hope the grandchildren were lucky. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. In just a moment, we'll take you for a visit with James M. Curley and his family in Boston. Here's a flashback to 42 years ago, 1915, when Amoco gas first saw the light of day. Amoco was the original special motor fuel. So good that it actually made the high compression engines we drive today possible. Well... It all happened 42 years ago. Amoco history is full of industry's firsts. For example, as far back as 1920, Amoco was first to introduce the visible gasoline pump 
so motorists could see what they're getting. And in 1927, Amoco made some very remarkable contributions. For example, did you know Amoco furnished the fuel that powered Lindbergh on his famous flight? Well, that's a fact. And Amoco gas was used exclusively on the first non-stop transatlantic flight from New York to Germany made by Clarence Chamberlain. And then in 1930 and 31, Amoco gas powered Ruth Nichols when she broke the woman's transcontinental west-east record and when she set a new altitude record for women. Well, moreover, down through the years, as credited by the American Automobile Association, cars using unleaded Amoco gas have established more world's records than any other gasoline in this country. Yes, with the pros of the road, unleaded Amoco gas is the overwhelming first choice. And be sure and be with us two weeks from tonight when Amoco continues its leadership with the most important announcement in gasoline history. And now here's Ed Murrow. James Michael Curley is 82 years of age. He's been in politics since 1900 when he was elected to the Boston Common Council. He subsequently served in the state legislature, was elected to Congress three times, and spent a term as governor of Massachusetts. But the job dearest to his heart was being four times mayor of Boston. James Curley was born in a Boston tenement, had to leave school at the age of 10 to help support his family. He drifted into politics, and as he says in his autobiography, I'd do it again. He wound up becoming the most controversial political personality of the first half of the present century. James Curley has been called a lot of things, a ham actor, a ruthless monster, a political Robin Hood, and the kingfish of Massachusetts, to name only a few. One thing he has never been called is dull. Mr. and Mrs. Curley live in this eight-room white frame house in the Jamaica Plain section of Boston. They moved to this home from their old 15-room mansion about five months ago. Good evening, Governor. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. That, that's what you're generally called, isn't it? Yes, sir. Tell me, how do you like the way your Boston Red Sox have started the season? Well, I wish they had uh, continued it, and I trust that uh, the leading batsman of the Red Sox will shortly regain his health and go in and start uh, making home runs every other afternoon. Good, so do I. Governor Curley, after 82 years of a rather busy life, do you consider yourself retired from politics? No, I anticipate I'm going to live to be 125 years of age, and I shall be active all of that time. Governor, what made you decide to get into politics in the first place? Well, there was no place where an Irish Catholic could get a position higher than driving a tip cart when I started looking for a job and I decided that politics offer the best opportunity for men regardless of race, creed, or color. Well, sir, in your book called I'd Do It Again, I think you referred to those early days as rock and sock politics. Was it really that rough? It was at times, yes. But we survived, we survived it very, very well. I think you told me a story once about a spittoon being thrown or something like that, didn't you? Well, uh, neither myself nor Senator Kelly could talk over 15 or 20 minutes. And I went down to the mall in Boston Common where they have speakers every Sunday and listened to a man talking on a single tax. So I invited him over. We had a very large gathering. And while he was talking, he was a very fine type of man, very well dressed. Behind him was a great large window, about 10 by 5. And suddenly I saw something coming through the air and I pulled him down on the floor. The something uh, was a steel spittoon weighing about 12 pounds, carried away the entire window with it where he was standing. It would have killed him without a doubt unless he'd been pulled to the floor. Uh, oh, some, about a year later, is a woman came to see me and said that her husband was dying. He wanted to ask my forgiveness before he died. So I went down to see him. He was superintendent of the brewery. He said, I'm the man that threw that steel spittoon. Well, I said, fortunately, I had a good grip on 
the coattails of the principal speaker, sat him on a platform before the platoon reached him. Well, now that things are a little more relaxed, uh, you can enjoy some of the pleasures of family life, can't you? Oh, surely. I'm doing that now. And I'm doing it in the same manner that you're doing it. I receive invitations to go and talk from time to time for various gatherings. And uh, it's been very, very different from the old days. They pay me to talk now. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm able to get along without holding any public office at the present time. Tell me, is Mrs. Curley at home tonight? Mrs. Curley is right here at home all the time. She's looking just as lovely as ever and sitting here listening to you. Good evening, Mrs. Curley. Good evening, Mr. Morrow. And uh, I believe that's your son, George, sitting beside you, isn't it? Yes. Good evening, George. Hi, Ed. How are you? Fine, How's thank you. you. Mrs. Curley, I imagine you have your hands full trying to make the governor live a quiet life, don't you? Well, it really has never been quiet. What with the telephone bells ringing and the doorbells and the constant stream of visitors, and an avalanche of mail, just so much going on, incident every week, practically. George, uh, it must have been a pretty exciting life for you, too. Well, I would say so, Ed. You see, father was mayor before I was born. So I've been brought up in politics, and uh, no matter where I've been, whether it's been in school or in, in the Navy or in private business, as I am now with the Clarkson Engineering Company, no matter what part of the world I've gone to, as soon as I hear the name Curly, they start talking politics and generally, and then it comes down to Massachusetts and down to Boston, and it keeps you on your toes. And the fact that I kiss the Blarney Stone helps a little, too. And generally, they want something, is that right? <laughs> generally, they want information, at least. Uh, Mrs. Curly, I understand that the governor on occasion sings a lilting Irish song, is that right? Well, actually, I think that he loves Irish songs. But there is a little tune that has been identified with him. And it's uh, known very well all over the states. Every, every dining room we ever went into, the little band would play Ireland the Cree. <coughs> <laughs> as, as fine a rendition as ever graced me ears. Well, thank uh, you very much. <laughs> Mrs. Curley, you've been in this house only a short time. Uh, are you completely settled yet? Oh, really? No, not yet. It's quite a problem, you see, because we have, with my husband as a collector, we had a great many beautiful things to settle here, and we have uh, found a few places that we could tuck them. And in this room here, as you notice, it's quite small, and yet we have a really fine collection of, well, this is the, really the choicest of his, of his fine uh, collection of China. It represents China from all over the world, you know, and that beautiful Venetian glass. Lovely. And then this really here would be the finest of these. And isn't that delightful? It's it is. It's a charming piece, you see, like a beautiful, beautiful. gold chalice. Very lovely indeed, and then of, of course a great many Irish uh, objects of art, the beautiful Waterford uh, candelabra, and, and these romantic pieces here. Yes. And I go back and show you other things. We hope sometime you'll be able to come here and spend a day or two. Thank you very much indeed, Governor. Uh, Governor, it's a rather general opinion that the character of Skeffington in the book, The Last Hurrah, is patterned after you. What do you say to that? Uh, well, Skeffington's dying words that are ascribed to me is probably exactly what I would say were I in Skeffington's place. He uh, said, if you had to do it all over again, what would you do exactly as I did? <laughs> I'll do it again. So we're getting out a book now, and the book will shortly be on the market in about five days. It's entitled, I'll Do It Again, by James Michael Curley. It contains about 400 pages. It's 
intensely interesting to anybody interested in politics. And I'm quite sure it's going to have a wonderful sale. It was certainly interesting to me, Governor. Governor, well, what influence do you think radio and television have had on politics? Better or worse? Radio and television have had a, a better influence on politics. Uh, when a man is on the air talking to the public over the radio, he's got to be very careful what he says and very careful about what he does. What is your own definition of good politics? Good politics is taking an interest in and endeavoring to help every individual that is traveling in uh, the darkness and without employment, without money, without a chance, without help. Those are the ones I've been taking care of all my life, and I hope to continue to take care of them until I'm 125 years old. Uh, what about the negative side, protecting yourself from your political enemies? Why, I never have any difficulty in doing that. I can recognize an enemy at once and counteract anything that he might say. And uh, after a while, you cease to have enemies. And by the time I'm 100 years old, all my enemies will be buried. <laughs> <laughs> Having a command of the language never harmed a politician, and that you've always had. Do you read as much poetry now as you used to, Governor? I do, yes, sir. Yes. Well, what, what's your favorite? Oh, Goldsmith. What? Goldsmith. Goldsmith, was it? Oh, Ernest, uh, Oliver Goldsmith? Yes. Yes, very much so. Governor, what's the best advice you ever received? Well, I think the best advice I ever received, I received my mother when I went into politics. What was that? She said, I hope you'll never go into it. <laughs> <laughs> but as you said, and as you titled your book, you'd do it again, wouldn't you? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much, Governor Curley. Well, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to come in contact with you. Thank you, Mrs. Curley, for letting us come and visit you. You're very welcome. Good night, George. Come on, Ed. Good night. Good night. Good night. We'll be back in a moment. Now at all Amoco dealers, America's greatest tire value, the all-new Amoco Nylon Cushion Deluxe. Made with a new Super 7 Nylon, this brand-new tire delivers the ultimate skid protection and tire safety you must have to avoid accidents on today's highways. The all-new Amoco Nylon Deluxe Cushion Tire is available now on your Amoco credit card with no down payment, no carrying charge, and six months to pay. And now here's Ed Murrow. Next week, we run the musical scale with visits to the homes of concert pianist Arthur Rubenstein and his family and pop singer Guy Mitchell and his wife. Those are some of the people who made tonight's program possible. And now from person to person, good night and good luck. Next Friday, Person to Person will be presented by Life magazine. In this issue, Atomic Energy Commissioner Thomas Murray tells why he feels it's dangerous to rely on the H-bomb and why we need smaller nuclear weapons to avoid defeat in a showdown with Russia. And for you parents, here's a Life picture report on a school experiment in which girls learn shop work and boys learn cooking. In life, you'll also meet Sophia Loren arriving in Hollywood with a $3 million contract. For fun, excitement, and information, read Life. Sunday's...